Welcome and thanks for joining me. I'm Dante St. James taking you through today's free ASBAS digital solutions um, webinar on delegation, letting it go, outsour outsourcing work to staff as well as contractors and outsourcing to offshore options as well. We're gonna go through all of this today. So please, if you've got any questions along the way, pop them in the uh, Zoom chat. I'll be able to answer those live or the Q and A is also an option too. If you're watching this along on YouTube, uh, please, um, this is after the fact, we're going to record this and put it on YouTube. Just whack some comments below and we'll be able to pop in and answer those at the time that we uh, can. In the meantime, let's get underway. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program in consultation with Regional Development in Australia, Brisbane and Queensland and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory, where I'm happening to be based this morning or this afternoon, actually. It's after lunch, I just scoffed some down myself. Here's a quote from Lee Kuan Yew, former Prime Minister of Singapore, saying, if you deprive yourself of outsourcing and your competitors do not, you're not, you're just going to put yourself out of business pretty much. And this doesn't mean necessarily offshore outsourcing. It means to outsource things from yourself, just making sure that you don't try and handle everything in your business all on your own. As an example, I have a couple of businesses now and, and all of my businesses like outsource my bookkeeping to a bookkeeper. I outsource my accounts to an accountant. I outsource my copywriting to a copywriter. I outsource even my scheduling and my calendar to a virtual assistant who works in the same city as I do, but she doesn't actually live in an office with me right here. Otherwise it'd be kind of weird because I like working from home. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy doing it. Let's move on. What we're going to look at today is why delegation is such an important thing in your business. We're going to look at when you need to delegate or possibly even outsource that or piece of work altogether. We look at the difference between employment, contracting and outsourcing for your business, as well as handling the workflow in general as we move across what you're doing in your business. A little bit of a background on me, I work with Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory, as well as the uh, NIST or New Enterprise Incentive Scheme uh, through the Australian Government, the ASBAS Digital Solutions Program that we are here on today. Work with Clickstart on my own digital agency. I've been educated through the University of New South Wales and the Australian Institute of uh, Marketing, as well as the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK. I did that one uh, um uh, what they call it, um, remotely, <laughs> because obviously I couldn't spend years in the UK studying. And I work very closely with Facebook's Boost with Facebook program as a lead trainer, digital marketing associate and media planning professional. Also got a little bit of work on from Google and their digital springboard program. Now, as we move into delegating, we want to know why it's so important, because let's face it, if you start up your business on your own, like I did, all my businesses are started on my own. One of them actually probably failed because of my failure to delegate effectively the work that was going out there. And when I say fail, it wasn't that it financially failed. It just failed to go anywhere, it failed to grow because I couldn't seem to hand off that work I was doing to someone else to go and do that work for me. So what we had to do is eventually I've learned that delegating out to other people is massively important because it frees me up to do the things that I do best that keep the business running. So adding people adds earning capacity. And this is based upon just maths. If your hourly rate is $150 per hour part-time, then you add in someone else who's a contractor at $80 per hour over a year, your capability of working goes up exponentially. So let's just look at you. You can work a certain amount of hours and do a certain amount of stuff, right? But once you add someone on that exponentially gets larger. It's not that that person can necessarily do twice the amount of work as you. What it allows you to do is other work that helps bring more people into the business and get the workflow going more successfully. Now, the key here is though, pay yourself more than you're going to be paying your staff because this is where it becomes a little bit scary is if you're paying people the same rate that you're being paid at, then you're going to go out of business really fast and you should should really be paying yourself a certain amount. But the whole point of outsourcing or bringing in someone else as an employee or a contractor is because 77%, according to the Queensland Department of Employment, Small Business and Training, of small business owners suffer burnout in their first three years of business. It is such a critical time. A lot of people say that for that first three years is absolutely critical for getting your business established and working. And I can certainly 
certainly base that. The first three years for me were the hardest. I'm in year five now with one of my businesses and everything's stabilized now. I can make predictions, I can make forecasts. And that came about around about through mid year three. Now, some businesses do move faster to stabilize than that, but that's usually because they've been able to scale themselves up much, much quicker and much, much more effectively than people who like me made that mistake in their first businesses to not scale up and not actually take the hit that comes along with adding new staff in. So you wanna be able to outsource or delegate work when you don't have the skills to do everything that needs to be done. And this is a case where, for instance, if you are running a, um, let's just say a bakery, now you know how to bake, that's fine. But do you have customer service skills? Do you have bookkeeping skills? Do you have the ability to be able to do all the cleaning up to a standard of the food health inspectors? Do you have the ability to be able to um, make even more specialized um, pastries rather than just bread baking? If not, that's when you might have to, to keep your business, you know, supplying customers with what they want, invest in someone else to do some of that work for you. Of course, though, there's also only so many hours in the day for you to do all the work. Can you imagine running your own butcher shop in a shopping center and you're the only person in there? You have to prepare the meat, you have to dress the meat, you have to keep ordering in the meat, you'd have to then be serving the customers the meat, everything you'd be doing all on your own. This is when there's only so many hours and so much capacity that you have to do. This is a lesson I still have to learn every single year that I'm in business, is the ability to be able to go, okay, no one does it quite as well as I do, so, and I don't trust anyone else to do it quite as well as I do, so, but the fact is I need to take a day off I need to have a couple of weeks off a year or even four, five, six weeks off a year if I possibly can. So I have to get someone else in there to do some of that work. Don't want to burn out, do we? According to Business Australia, 24% higher customer dissatisfaction takes place in sole traders, freelancers and micro businesses because we tend to have our work taking longer and Sometimes we have a lack of ability to be contacted because we're trying so hard to get the work done. If you're working in a consultancy of some sort or you're doing some kind of work from home thing, this is who I'm talking to. People like myself who run a business from home, sometimes we're really hard to get on the phone because we're in so many meetings. We're trying to concentrate and zero in and doing some sort of creative work or some kind of work where you're meeting with people in the, who are coming through the door and you're having a consultation or a some kind of session with them. You can't answer the calls then. What we're finding though, is because you're unable to do that unless you have some processes in place or you're outsourcing your contact through to people that you're getting that higher level of customer dissatisfaction because people simply can't get to you. And the work that you're trying to do, if it's not by the hour, if it's say project-based, like a, building a website or um, writing an ebook for people, that's the sort of stuff which is then taking longer and longer and longer to do. So let's look at what that skills coverage matrix is. And by skills coverage, I mean, you're able to do everything that's in that yellow circle, right? So what you wanna do is when you add your first person, you want someone who can do quite a lot of the things you do, but not necessarily all of them. You need them to do some of the things you do. Let's just say about a third of the things you do, they're able to do plus other stuff as well. So what it does is it doesn't just give you someone else who can do a bunch of the stuff you do. This is someone who can take on different kinds of work. They can then you know, expand the offering in your business. Say for instance, if you're running a consultancy where you're an agency, say for insurance, then if you've got insurance agency and you run it mainly based on uh, business insurance this person could come in has a little bit of knowledge about business insurance but has a heck of a lot of knowledge about car insurance you're then able to be a broker who can offer services not just in business insurance but in car insurance as well once you add your second person you've already had number one they too will have a bit of overlap with what you do and they'll have a bit of overlap with what your first person's had too 
then they'll bring in another world of skills that they've got. So again, your skills base in your business grows as you add those people on because every single person is going to come with different skills, different capabilities, and different qualifications and experiences that allow them to add a bit more diversity to your business. Now that diversity could be in the realm of skills. It also could be in the realm of languages. You wonder, right? If you speak only English, then you can add on someone who speaks Spanish and then you add on someone who speaks Mandarin, you've now got a multilingual office, which allows you to more effectively serve people from three different major language groups. That would be exciting for me in my particular position because then I'm able to have people who can work not only in English, but in Spanish and in Chinese as well. And as you can see, that grows on and on and on. So when do you need to delegate or outsource? It's when your production time takes long, too long. If you're trying to produce a whole lot of, um, let's just say something very contemporary, um, home handmade uh, face masks. So these are ones which are made with triple layers. They've got all the stuff that helps you to, to keep those viruses at bay. Well, making those will take a long time if it's just you making them in your basement at home. Or if you're making them on your little um, Janome sewing machine at home, you're then not able to produce that many. You can maybe produce, oh, let's just say 10 a day at the tops, unless you're very, very quick at it and you can produce about 20. But let's say you've just had an order for 150 of those. If you can only produce 10 a day, it's going to take you 15 days of working solidly to make that many masks. When your production time, because of the limits that you have in the time hours of the day and your ability to produce something quickly, takes too long for the customer, they will have a lack of satisfaction with you and they'll either move on, cancel orders, or they're just never going to come back to you. Your customer, if you know your customer dissatisfaction is rising, that's when you got to bring someone in. When your reviews and ratings are showing a bit of a decrease in, in the goodwill, there's no satisfaction showing. This is something I happened to go through in 2018 when I knew that I could not keep up with the demand for what I was doing at the price I was doing it. So I had to do one of three things. I either shut down the business because I can't cope and I'm stressed out, or I put someone on who can help me to get that work done. Or the third option was to put my prices up so I could slow down the um slow down the onslaught of people coming in to take control of this and take advantage of this offer. Now I chose to do two things. Yes, I put my prices up, which slowed things down, and I added someone in so that I could have at least a good flow of customers coming in the door without having to do all the work myself. And this is also another place where you need to delegate or outsource your work is where you can't compete unless you offer a broader product line. So for instance, like the insurance agency we we're just talking about, if they can't compete with other brokers because they're only offering business insurance, yet other brokers are offering health, um, personal life insurance, business insurance, car insurance, home and content insurance as a brokerage altogether, then you're gonna have a struggle to compete against them because they offer a bigger range of products or a bigger range of services, or they consult on a far broader range of things. Another example would be say a digital marketing agency. If they only operate on Facebook and all they do is Facebook ads, then they're gonna come up against the problem when someone says, hey, do you know how to build a website? Or, hey, do you know how to use LinkedIn? Or, hey, do you know how to get me to the number one page on Google? If they can't answer those questions, that customer is gonna take that money they were willing to spend on that product and spend it with someone else. So if you cannot compete unless you offer a broader product line, if your customer satisfaction is on the rise, if your production or your service times are taking way too long to deliver, that's when you might need to look at maybe delegating or outsourcing a little. But when you do, there's a variety of ways you can do it. You can do it by employing someone, you can do it by contracting someone, or you can do it by outsourcing. And the, and the more traditional method of outsourcing we're looking at is beyond contracting and perhaps even going offshore to be able to do that. So some of the advantages are for employment is you're looking for a more stable, long-term committed workforce. So you're looking for someone who is, is going to be fairly well invested in your business as well. Now, we know that we're not expecting 10 out of 10 from every employee because let's face it, isn't their business, it's yours. You give 10 out of 10 every time but you can expect a good seven out of 10 from them. That's a pretty good result for someone who doesn't own the business and has no holding in the business to be able to give you a bit of their time 
in the week to be able to help you achieve your goals and they get compensated fairly for that as well. That's employment, but contracting is a lower overall cost for you. Now the per hour cost is going to be more than if you were going to employ someone, but you don't have to be paying things like entitlements leave. You don't have to be paying things like, um, you know, um, loading on leave. There's no sick days, none of that, because they are essentially running their own business that's contracting its time to your business. So they're also a business owner and they may have other contracting. It's far less complex than employing someone. It is far more flexible than employing someone. If you only need someone for five hours a week, you can contract someone for five hours a week. It might be a little hard to get someone to commit to employment for less than a couple of hours, like less than you know four hours a week as a casual, but 20 hours a week as a part-timer. And if you don't have quite the work to justify 20 to 38 hours a week when it comes to part-time and full-time employment, contracting might be the option that's really available for you. That's what I do. I contract. I don't, I'm not employed by anybody. I don't have a job. I contract to things like the ASVAS Digital Solutions Program. It takes around about 10 hours of my week at present. Um, then I'll, I'll contract to the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme. Now that takes another 20 hours per week of my time. Then I contract to Treaty Business Consulting. There's another 10 hours. That's made up 40 hours of my week. And then all the other time I either work on my own business or I work on other contracts for other businesses so that I've got a, probably about a 50 hour week, which is you know, probably a little bit more than it should be. Sometimes it creeps up to 60 because I just have to get the work done and I have to work on weekends. But the flexibility is there that I can lose any one of those things and I'm still got a good income coming through from the four or five other options that I've got that I'm working on at the time. Is it difficult? It can be. Is it um, complex? Yes, it is. Does it have really interesting tax times? Yes, it does, which is why I've got a really good accountant and a really good bookkeeper to handle all that. As, as someone who's going to employ people, I prefer to employ contractors because I don't have to do all that additional paperwork. Where the funny thing comes in though, if that person has got more than 80% of their income coming through uh, as a contractor, they may be entitled to actually get some entitlements from there. So I, I usually just go, look, the contracts are short term, work for me for three months or work for me for six months, but not for 12 months, because then that becomes pretty much full-time employment. And there's some repercussions with tax and with um, employment and industrial relations law that comes with it. When it comes to outsourcing though, this can be a much, much lower cost and much, much more flexible. Um, I have used, I'm not currently using anybody offshore at the moment, but I have used people in the Philippines who I've been able to use on various projects in very, very um, flexible ways. I've had a full-time staff member who I use in the Philippines who I still occasionally will outsource some work to. Um, but then I've also got um, a group of people that I deal with in the Philippines, Vietnam and it also in South Africa, who I may you know, need certain work done through and I will contract their company to do the work and then they get the people together to do that work. Let's say for instance, if I wanted to build a mobile app, I don't know how to do that. I don't really want to know how to do that, but my clients may want to know how to do that. So what I'll do is I'll work in conjunction with an app development agency, either in Australia or overseas, and I'll find out how much it's going to cost, whether they're capable of doing it, and then say, okay, have you got the team that can carry all this out on their own? Because we're not doing any of the work. We're just becoming a project manager. And that's how I would use outsourcing. I don't do the work. I just project manage the work being done by someone else. Typically, outsourcing is done as an offshore option. So um, quite often you'll find that much of the outsourcing goes on today's world is in the Philippines because there's a similar, there's a very easy cultural reference there. Um, there's, there's also a lang no language barrier. Just about everyone in the Philippines speaks English, is educated in English, and therefore it's very easy to communicate with them. A little bit more difficult when you're dealing with some other countries where English is not quite as common and that's why we've found that the Philippines has been a lot really, really easy to deal with because um, that language barrier just isn't there. You might find though, it's easy to work with someone in Ukraine who has been educated in English or dealing with a team in say Mumbai or um, Bengaluru in, in India because they're very large tech centers with lots of these teams that are ready to do things with lots of different skills. 
The disadvantages of each one of these are that employment is expensive, it's complex, it's got legal requirements, it's um, got a large, it's got a, a lot of repercussions that come with it. It's, it's not the favoured way for many businesses to deal with these days, but if you're looking for that long-term stable workforce who's going to turn up every week, largely, sometimes get bad apples, but largely um, the white people, then employment is the way to go. Contracting can be pretty, um, can have a bit of an offside because often contractors only want to work with you short term and they don't want long term commitments. I'm a bit like that. I don't like working long term commitments. I want to work on projects and move on to the next thing because, you know, you're trying to hang a shiny object in front of me and I just go, oh, what's that? What's that? <laughs> because I like to work on things quickly get in, get out and work on the next thing and get excited that way. Some people are that way geared and they tend to be people like me who do contract. Outsourcing though can have problems with communication barriers as I was saying, uh, particularly if you're dealing with cultural barriers, sometimes with people in um, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan um, and in um, Bangladesh, there can be some very, very um, big communication problems, not because of a lack of English, because all those countries have a widespread education in English. Um, their English actually is way better than most Australians. Where the problem may come up is that there's a cultural barrier that you don't quite understand, or it could be that we're so used to in Australia speaking in a very colloquial, very um, generalised and vague sort of English. We don't tend to get to the point and have solid lists of things to do. So if you don't have that and you're dealing with a team in another country who's, who's absolutely, um, you know, they're, they're, they're completely dependent on your parent, you knowing exactly what you want to get and you've got the measures in place to measure whether that thing is right and to make sure that the thing comes through in the way, in the shape and the form that you said you wanted it to come through, then you may have a bit of trouble working with offshore outsourcing. And it can be a wildly varying cost depending upon who you're using. If anyone's ever been to Fiverr or to Elancer or um, any of those freelance sites or Airwork, um, any of those, you can really see that there is a lot of difference in what people will charge and often you will get what you pay for. Well, and there's also differences in currency. It's going to cost you a lot less to employ someone uh, or contract someone or outsource to someone in the Philippines than it is in Indonesia because there's a different currency mismatch between Australia and there. It can be outsourcing to America even. And you've got to remember that their currency is usually in a much more favorable, posi favorable position to our currency. Or you may be outsourcing to somewhere like South Africa where we do have a favorable currency, but it's much more expensive dealing with them than it is dealing with, say, someone in Uganda or in um, Nigeria where you can get quite very talented people with technical skills um, that aren't so great when it comes to being able to deal with them on a language basis. So now we know what the pros and cons can be. Let's look a bit more deeply into the employment part. So employment is good when you've got lots of ongoing stable work that you can forecast. The revenue doesn't change much from month to month. It's stable. You have a good cash flow. You have a solid pipeline of new work and new customers coming through all the time or very solid repeat customers coming through all the time. You may have a specific, specific set, a, sorry, specific, I always have trouble with that word, specific need for very specific skills. The work that needs to be done needs a very dedicated person on a very dedicated task that's very specific. It may be they need to be a CSS programming writer. They may need to be someone who knows how to use an overlocker. They need to be someone who understands the intricacies of immigration law within Australia, or they need to be someone who understands something like how they have to have their... Um, their coxswain's uh, license or ticket or a forklift ticket, anything really that you need to have that requires a very specific skill that you're willing to pay for. And it requires a level of training for that person before they even come into your business. Employment's good when you've got a very solid idea of what your company culture is. If 
you are likely to have a great company culture. You're likely to have a lot of people who want to buy into that. Employees are far more likely to want to buy into your teamwork ethos, into your culture, into your big picture plans and get excited about things than what a contractor or an outsourcer would. A contractor is, could not be expected to get excited about your company culture because quite frankly, they don't have anything to do with your company except to occasionally do some work for it. The same with outsourcers. They already work for a company if they're not just working for themselves. So they're not going to get excited about what your big picture is or what your culture is or what your view of teamwork is. You're going to have to work that a little bit harder if that's important to you to have your outsourcers and contractors to buy into your culture. It's also good when you have an office or a shop or a premises of your own because employees like to work from a workplace. They're not massive fans of working from home. Some are. We've seen over the last year during COVID-19 that some employees really like the idea of working from home. I had the beauty for nearly eight of my 13 years with a previous employer of being able to work from home in that time. I loved it and I still love it. I love to be able to like, for instance, you know, 10 minutes before we started this call, I was able to get the washing out of the dryer, fold it, put it away, make some lunch, quickly rush in here and be able to do, oh, and also took the rubbish down to the, um, to the rubbish room downstairs in my building as well. As all those little things I could do because I happen to be working from home, I'm still very connected to all the people I'm working with. And I'm actually popping into the office a little bit later this afternoon to see them but the working from home thing works for me and for a lot of people, but most employees don't like it. They wanna to go to a workplace because they wanna maintain a very strong definition between home and work. Work is not necessarily their whole world. The, your business might be your whole world, but they're, but they're working there is not necessarily the whole world. So, But it also helps you to maintain a quality control and you have to monitor performance a lot more if that's something that you seem to be concerned about. Contracting though is really good when you need a short term skill just for a little while. You don't need that skill all the time. You just need it for a little while. Let's just say you're an ironing service and you want someone who's very, very good at ironing very delicate fabrics. You're not good at it. You don't know what to do, but you want someone who absolutely is. Or if you're doing clothing alterations, you want someone who knows how to work with taffeta or with other very fine and very finicky um, lace work, that kind of thing. That's when you might need to get someone in for a very short term specific skill because you've just got a contract or you just want a job, which means that you need to look after all these wedding dresses for a particular bridal um, boutique and you're not able to do that work yourself and that work's not gonna last that long, it's only three months. That could be a great way of getting someone in. You contract them in just to do that work and then they move on. It could be also good when you are working on a project and that project has an end date. So it could be building a home. You don't necessarily wanna be um, employing a whole team of people who are building homes when you only build homes for maybe six months of the year because the weather's inclement at different parts of the year. So you gotta make sure that you can do the right thing at the right time with the right people and knowing that you've got a limited amount of time to do that in. Um, having an end date makes it really good for you to be able to work on projects as a contractor. It's also good for when the skill is too expensive long-term. So if you want that thing in to do with that project and to do that one piece of work, then you have to have someone who comes in and, and only have them for a short period of time because that skill is too expensive to be employing them for a long period of time or forever. If you get some, and this is particularly um, important when it comes to people who work in something like marketing or someone who works in an area such as, um, you know, technical stuff, making websites, all that sort of thing. It's not, it's not cash effective for me to be hiring someone who is a node.js developer for this one project I want to have, but bring them on full time to always do node.js work. Because frankly, I only have that work maybe come in once a year for about three weeks. I don't want to then be paying that person to sit around and do nothing when generally a node.js developer starts in Australia at around about $120,000 a year. I don't have that spare. I don't know if you do. That's what you would do. If the skill is too expensive to do over the long term, contracting someone in to do that would be the ideal place to do it. 
And it's also good when you want to test something out first. Now you may have a view to bring on this new um, a chef or a or a pastry baker to come into your to your bar or your restaurant for a while, and you go, well, I I'm, I don't know if this is going to work completely, so let me just contract them in for you know let's say six weeks, three months, just to see if this thing works, if people really like this thing that I'm doing. If that's the case, employment's not good for you until you know that this thing's going to work after six weeks or three months. And you know, this thing's going gangbusters and everyone likes that. Then you can negotiate to bring on that contractor full time, or you can, you know, get a different person in to be that position full time. The contractor doesn't want to be a full time or even a part time employee. It gives you time to test the waters first and start them off as a contractor and then maybe offer them full time. The last job I had worked the same way. I was a contractor for about three months. They liked what I did. They took me on for a year and a half as a full time employee. And eventually I didn't want to be an employee anymore. I wanted to run my own stuff and contract again. And there was no harm, no foul. It's just the flow of work these days comes in as contracts, comes in as full time. You'll come in and out that with your employees as well. Sometimes they may prefer to be a contractor. Other times they may go, no, I want to go full full time because I need the holiday pay. And finally, outsourcing is really good when a skill is way too expensive in Australia. And this is a sad fact that we do have some skills that are very, very expensive here. If you want to get someone who is a lead generator, um, that could be a skill that is very expensive in Australia because the average pay for an Australian worker is a lot of money. But it may not cost you as much if that person is, say, in another country where English is the first language, where they can generate leads by making cold phone calls or perhaps you may want to have someone answer your phone who speaks English, but doesn't necessarily live here in Australia. So you can then pay somebody who's a receptionist starting at about $40,000 a year, or you could pay someone in the Philippines starting at around about $9,000 a year. That's a massive difference and a big saving. And it's hard to say no to that, even though you'd like to be able to offer more jobs to Australians. But I look at it this way. When you're able to outsource those, those, those very, very specific things that are very, very overpriced and expensive, not overpriced, people need to earn a living wage, but when they're expensive things to do here, it makes sense that some things you're just gonna have to do offshore. Sometimes that may be your bookkeeping. Offshore bookkeepers are excellent because they know the rules, they know the laws, and it's a very repetitive thing that doesn't cost you much to do. Other things that may be good for doing that is an expensive skill in Australia, things like developing apps, developing software, um, websites to a degree, but there's so many grants available in Australia to use Australians that it does kind of make sense to just use someone in Australia, or it could be someone who is doing video production work for you, where you send them all the raw files and you say, this is the format I want it in. And they go and do that grunt work for you. That to do in Australia will be very expensive, but offshore, it becomes a much, much cheaper, usually 90% cheaper than what it would be to do it in a regional area, say like Cairns or Darwin or Port Hedland, where the local person who does that has no competitors and knows he's got the market completely locked down. It's also good when you need a variable workforce that needs to grow and shrink at various times. You can do this with contracting as well. Uh, if you're working in a hospitality place that you can add people in and take them away as you need to. Outsourcing is particularly good for that when you've got a call center environment or you've got an environment which needs people to um, you know, do follow-up calls, that kind of thing. When you don't need those people all year round, you just need them in say January through to March then you can have that workforce just do that job just for that period of time. And it's going to cost you a lot less than what it would be to hire that many people to work for you for three months locally. Outsourcing also makes a remarkable lot of sense when you need coverage that's after hours. Now, this is really big in areas such as hospitality, hotels. Now, you don't necessarily have overnight staff which are answering phones in every hotel in Australia. Some of the smaller boutique hotels will actually hire someone offshore who can answer it during their business hours, which is on the other side of the world, that they can answer those overnight calls that are coming through, even dealing with the things that come up from guests inside the hotel. There's um, where I live in Darwin, there's probably about four different hotels or boutique um, b and &B kind of places that operate this way. If you're going to call them, it actually usually goes to the offshore call call provider and they're able to answer it in the exact same way you would ever have with anything else. 
it's a really good experience if someone after hours doesn't get a message saying call us again at nine o'clock and they're like uh dude i'm not going to call at nine o'clock the plumbing is broken in my room in your hotel that's when you have a great customer experience by having someone answer that call overnight it's not overnight for them remember they're working in their hours over in another part of the world so it actually works really well to have someone in that kind of situation that's when outsourcing is of a lot of use for you so I'm going to have a bit of a story here about a company I used to work with many years ago. Um, we decided that it was time to outsource when the recruitment costs got too high for specific roles that we were doing. The cost for the employee was way too high to do it locally as well. And the tech skills didn't exist. Now, what this was is that we had a real problem with cultural fit. Um, we had people who didn't really like to deal with anybody who wasn't speaking English the way they spoke English. And you can read between the lines there. There were some people who weren't particularly open to people from other places. Um, and there was no experience in this company when it came with, out, with outsourcing offshore. They'd never done it before. And they always felt a little bit weird about it and felt like it was a bit of a, 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 a forbidden land to go into because they'd always employed people full time. The outcome for this particular project, which was to develop um, streaming video and streaming music players for their radio stations, was that we needed to find a fine line that would work for everybody. So we outsourced the work to the US because it was too expensive to develop that within, within ourselves here. And there was already products that are being well developed in the US. So we outsourced that work to the US mostly. And we did some onshore outsourcing as well with some local providers or outside. This was a project that did not need us to employ a team of people to be able to do that work because that work was only going to last for about six weeks to build it. After that, it was just maintenance. And then they could offer a maintenance package so we can get hold of them when we needed that help. But if we didn't have that approach and we tried to hire people, it would have become an unsustainable beast of a thing to have to pay for and it just wouldn't have worked. They would have ended up sacking everyone in the end and it wouldn't have become the success that it happens to have been right now. So sometimes outsourcing is not a wholesale thing. It's not like a, I'm taking everything that I do in Australia and outsourcing it to the Philippines. That's not what we're talking about. It's usually going to be a hybrid model where you've got some people who work locally with you, some people who are outsourced within Australia. So they might be in another state or another town at least working for you in that respect. Or there's someone who works in a call center or some kind of group overseas in the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, in South America, in South Africa, even in Europe or America, where they can have a good cultural fit with you. They can speak your language clearly and be understood clearly, but they are not someone who has to be right here in Australia with you at the time. Outsourcing does have a dirty word about it, I suppose, because we've all experienced bad examples of what we call call centers where people haven't understood what we're saying and we're not understanding what they're saying. And they're kind of just reading blindly off a script and not really listening to what you're doing. Good training is a massive part of this, making sure you train your offshore people to do the things the way you would do it. The story of my own business click start, it was a lot of time to hire locally when, now this is, was this was not an outsourcing thing. This was me hiring my first full-time staff member and it made sense to do it when I was trying to do it from outsourcing, but it took me too much time to interpret everything. It was, it was too hard to manage people offshore. And I just went, you know what? I just want someone who I can just tell them once how to do something and then they go away. This is the case where th this happened. It's where I needed a local person, for instance, to handle contact with clients. The clients weren't particularly open to having to call a call center. They wanted to be able to rock them up and have a meeting and be able to see someone who was right there in front of them and talk to them. It was also a problem that um, cost and superannuation come complexity with problems. And it made look, it just seemed like this insurmountable barrier to me becoming an employer. But ultimately, I was actually able to learn a new skill, the ability to be able to hire someone. Look, that first person was the hardest person I've ever had to hire. But the second person was that little bit easier. And then the third person was easier again because I'd done it. 
And it probably helped that the first person I hired was able to work all that stuff out to become also my quasi HR person to help me hire the second and the third person as well. The result though, was I had a massive increase in my capacity and the revenue increased way more than my costs did. If my costs increased by 300%, my revenue increased by about 1200% because the efficiency that came in got me out of the way, which is the biggest problem in my business that I was too slow and I'm trying to do everything myself. I bring in people who could do those things more effectively than me, man, the whole thing grew and became so much more successful. In the case of Trinity Business Consulting, who I work with, we knew that it was time to hire contractors when we moved from repeated work that was always very predictable and forecasting to new work in projects we want to do, particularly with, um, you know, with, with, with digital projects, websites, social media marketing, that kind of thing. Now, there wasn't enough work coming in for that particular stuff in order for it to employ someone, to bring someone on full time, to be a web developer, to be a social media manager. Uh, but there was enough work for us to go, we do need to get someone in. So some of the problems were that there was a lot of initial training that would have to happen. There was a definite cultural fit that would have to happen there as well. And the other problem was too that um, that person who we want to get in there may not be available to us all the time. They will work on other things. As someone who does contract a treaty, I can tell you now that that's sometimes the case where I'm not available to them all the time to answer a call or to hop in a meeting because I'm working on other things because I'm working for my business as well as their business. The outcomes were that we had a significant increase to our skills and capacities to form a whole new area of business. And it allowed some of our staff to stop being generalists and start to be very, very specialized very specialized in some of their roles. So someone became very much um, a, a workflow manager and was able to successfully manage projects going through. Someone was able to become another particular role that they said, well, I don't really like doing all these other things. I want to do this thing over there. So having contractors in allow us to have those people to specialize and do the things they were good at. And in most cases, do the things they love doing without doing all the stuff they didn't like doing. It makes for a much happier workforce, really. What you will need in place though, when you do start to outsource, hire people or add contractors is some solid workflow systems. Now you can go from a smaller business having something free like Trello, which is a task management system. It's kind of like columns, almost like this page really. Columns where you just go, okay, column one is to do, then there's the doing column, then there's the done column. And you move things from the to do column to the doing column as you're working on it. And from the doing column to the done column to help you manage the work that's coming through and have a place to put the notes down for what's happening. Tied in with something like Google Calendar, which I still use this day to schedule everything I do. Um, you can, as, a, as, a, as an employer or a contract a holder of mine, just go into my calendar anytime and see that when I'm available, when I'm not available. It's a very open thing to be able to do. If you get more sophisticated, you start moving into things like Asana and, and using Microsoft Outlook perhaps to manage your workflow of your business. You might get to the idea where monday.com, which is an excellent system for managing workflow because you set it up pretty much to match what you do. And it's got a lot of templates for different kind of businesses. So you can match what happens and when, what the, the flow of work in and out of your business is going to be. And then using something like Workflow Max, working with your zero system can be a really successful way to get that workflow through, especially if you're working in quite complex management of um, projects. And then the big kahuna at the end is Salesforce. So very big companies tend to have Salesforce, things like um, Southern Cross or Stereo, television radio network. Um, you find that banks will have this. Quite often government agencies will even use Salesforce. It's probably the most sophisticated and the biggest. And by and they're a huge company, their own too, based in, in San Francisco, a massive company that's been able to very, very successfully um, tap into the need for businesses big and small to have a workflow system so they understand that what happens is work comes in here and it goes to this person and from that person it goes to that person it's based on the kanban system that was in use in the 1950s and 60s in toyota 
in Japan. Um, the, the American car manufacturers were struggling to work out problems with their workflow. What happened that Henry Ford set up what was called the production line and pretty much invented that. And the problem is the production line wasn't actually very efficient because it wasn't sustainable. People got bored of doing the same thing and the same repetitive movements over and over again and getting injured. So what he found is he needed to use another su more successful way of getting this work done. And the system of called Kanban coming from Toyota in, in Japan um, was a way of much more simply and successfully keeping work flowing moving through, but also keeping the flow of your employees moving through so they were able to change your work on different things. Not everyone was specialized into a role, they were specialized in the three or four roles that they could be moved around quite easily to keep them engaged and interested. And that's how we get a lot of the workflow systems of today like Trello and even Asana and Monday all work pretty much on the Kanban flow of work coming in and coming out. So if you want to learn more about this kind of thing, especially when it comes to uh, employment law, you can actually get free advice on this through Business Australia. Business Australia is like a combination of all the chambers of commerce, like the CCIQ, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, WA, and the Northern Territory Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce. It's a place where you can get employment industrial relations advice for members of different chambers of commerce. Uh, you can do it through there. You can also get free advice and free membership through Business Australia. Um, to a degree. Your local chambers of commerce um, in WA, Queensland and Northern Territory are much more versed in your local laws and in the local requirements, whereas Business Australia will give you much more generalised assistance, but it is free. Just become a free member at businessaustralia.com.au and you'll be able to take advantage of that one right there. It's a good service. I've used it a couple of times when I wanted to ask some questions about COVID stuff. They had some great materials and some great, um, great advice written down on the website and also a available through their call center. <clears throat> If you're looking to outsource some places to start with, might be good for you to get to know Fiverr if you want to get some outsourcing of things like graphics done, video done, stuff like that. If your outsourcing is more about you know real world things to get done, so not um, sitting on computer things, more like I just need someone to pick up my laundry, I need someone to go and do my shopping for me, Airtask is really good for that, both here in Australia and elsewhere around the world. It's a really good way to get people to do those little repetitive things every week that you just don't want to have to do. It's like the Uber of getting things done, really, I suppose. Onlinejobs.ph is the Philippines source center. They're an agency of sorts, I guess, for you to hire people to work on things for you remotely from the Philippines. Um, they have some great stuff in there where they actually handle the management of that person rather than you having to handle it. And there's um, also ways for them to have a meeting with that person monthly to ensure that they're both satisfied with what they're doing and they don't have massive problems with you. Some more sort of wild, wild west sort of areas, probably things like Upwork and Freelancer, which are both um, freelancer.com and upwork.com, which allow you to outsource tasks to other people in other countries, everything from bookkeeping through to design and graphics and websites and social media and all that kind of stuff. Once you've got those things though, you need to make sure your processes are really defined so you can save that person on Upwork this is exactly how I go from the idea through the implementation of posting of something on my social media account to get them to do that. Um, you need to, though, have already worked out how to do all that, and then you're then training them on how to do it, and then they go and they continue to do that for you. Like I said, you need to have really good workflow systems in place, a really solid idea of how to do it. That will often mean having a really good written set of standard operating procedures. This is how you open the door in the morning. This is how you open the call center in the morning. This is what you say when someone says this. This is what you do when someone complains. Everything documented out so they know how to follow it to the letter and be able to give you the best possible result they possibly can. They're not going to, these outsourcing is not a case of buying people who are empathetic and buying people who are going to think on their feet. That's what your employees are for. Your outsourcers are going to take care of the repetitive tasks that you don't want to have to do yourself. That's how you use your outsourcing. So thank you very much for joining me. It's been a nice, quick, short, sharp one. My email address is danteatreaty.com.au if you'd like to know more about this. Uh, I've got some advice on where to go or who to speak to when it comes to contracting, outsourcing,
Sourcing and employment. Um, you can also catch up with me on both LinkedIn and Facebook as well. I welcome you joining me there. And um, aside from that, though, you can watch this again on YouTube through the Business Station and my own channel. I'll be putting this up in around about two hours time. Uh, Business Station usually around about the same as well. Being a Friday might be till Monday, but I'll make sure I get mine up there. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope to hear from you soon and enjoy your weekend and have a good coming week as well. Thank you and good afternoon.